Any objection yes. to that? I think we have our quorum. So why don't we officially open the meeting and if Howard comes, then he can, uh, he can take over the chair. So I will uh, call the meeting to order at 710 on the 26th of January. So the first thing on our agenda is the review, the budget schedule. So Jean, I'll just go to you first and what's your sense of, of how we should proceed with the schedule? Do, do you wanna take this a little out of order and approve the meeting minutes to how it can be part of that conversation? Oh, okay, that's fine. And, and, and the only thing I, I do wanna update you on, we did um, our minute taker resigned. So we actually have an ad out for a new one now. So if you could please state your names when you, I don't know when they're gonna actually do the minutes, but um, when you speak, just identify yourself. And um, we may wanna identify yourself on a roll call vote to open the meeting as well. So okay. That's what I was gonna suggest is we should do a roll call vote of who's yeah. here. Okay, so let's begin with that. So I'll begin, um, uh, Dick Vandenberg here. Lynn Mazzulli here. Michael Lutnack. Andy Kuypers here. Yep. Phil Landry here. Heather Morin here. Okay, I think that's everybody, right? Okay, and then Matt's here and then Gene is here, okay. All right, so we'll go out of order, everybody. If you look at your agenda, let's go down to the fourth item which is approved meeting minutes. Did everybody get a chance to look at those? I'm looking at them right now. Okay, does anybody have any comments, questions about the meeting, our most recent meeting minutes? I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes. From October 2020. Okay, say the date. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, anybody second? Second. All right, Heather. Heather Morin seconds. Uh, any discussion on that? All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? I'm going to abstain because I didn't get a chance. Or I missed this meeting. Um, okay. So, so Lynn Mazzulli abstains. Okay. Do we have do we have enough to approve if I abstain too as well? I haven't finally looked through everything. I'm printing it out now as we speak. No. I think we do we need four or five, is it for a quorum? Five. Five, six. So if Lynn abstains, I think we needed you Phil to to be there. Okay. Yeah, then, then, then go ahead. I, I'll, I'll add my eye to it. Um, okay. It's pretty good so far from what I've read. So it is what it is. All right. So those minutes are approved. All right. You want to go back to you then, Gene? Uh, just your overview on the FY22 schedule? I'm actually going to give that to, to Matt. All right. Matt, you have the floor. Gene, that's uh, 20 demerits for passing the buck. <laughs> I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> part of what I, I think um, scheduling is, I'm not a big believer in just checking boxes for the sake of checking boxes. A committee should spend its time reviewing the things that it has the most interest in, investigating the issues that you think you really want to weigh in on as we go through the budget. Um, so I, I always default to the notion that someone has to establish the bottom line budget, which begins with an inquiry into revenues available to the town. And We've we've kind of we've we've slid into this habit where Gene and I just kind of pre present a, a revenue budget and everybody says okay, you know, and then we build a budget around that number. And I just 
in my view of the world, and it's just an opinion, the Finance Committee has a couple of very important roles, and one of them should be to look at the overall financial health of the committee, of the community, of the town, and determine from the revenue forecast whether you want to spend that much money uh, and whether you agree with the um, establishing the areas of growth and revenue or whether you agree with our estimates or our best advice. That way, in your role appointed by the moderator representing the town meeting, the legislative branch, we now, it's almost like when Congress creates budget authority, they create budget authority, they say to the departments, all right, you have 100 units of budget authority and the departments come back and they can't spend more than 100. Um, that would be good for us. And it would also be good to have a conversation about, um, and this is where I guess I just don't know because I don't think Massachusetts ever defines it anywhere in really strong terms, who should be deciding or estimating the budget available for capital spending from sources that you have or you anticipate having, uh, free cash being the obvious biggest source. Because I think both Gene and I, and I, I, I don't think I'm over my skis to speak for the, the chairman of the capital committee, it would be helpful, for instance, if the capital committee was told, well, you have 900,000 to spend this year and we wanna roll the rest of free cash over to next year. Then when they set their priorities, they can be shooting for that target left to their own devices. I mean, they're gonna follow um, either a recommendation from, from me or from Gene or from what they, is in their mind is the best judgment. But when you think about the long-term health of the community, free cash is a critical linchpin of that. And the capital committee is appointed by the board of selectmen. The other way you could look at this is say, the board of selectmen can set these goals because they'll present a budget to FinCom and you decide in the end what the final number is going to be anyway. But for our purposes, since capital committee is appointed by the selectmen and so am I and so is Gene, uh, we can follow the guidance of the board of selectmen. But someone other than your day-to-day -day administrative officers should be establishing what those numbers are. That's just my opinion. It, it, it just makes the whole system work better. So that's, a, that's a, a meeting very early in the process. You take a step back and almost look at the high level financials of the town to, to determine what we've got uh, available to us. That really smooths things over because when you think about it, after that, you can start meeting with departments almost at whatever your interest level is after that because what difference does it make if we have a general sense of what the bottom line has to look like and we're, we're sticking to that bottom line We'll, uh, internally, we'll have a process for working out how that is generated. To date, and this is, I guess this will be my fourth budget here as town administrator, it's always been, we try to honor our commitments to personnel first, because we do have quite a few employees who are members of collective bargaining units with a valid agreement. So we really can't escape that. And then we try to equalize the treatment of our non-union employees to that of our union employees. And um, so we set the same COLA and we look to make sure that pay equity is in force uh, as between people with similar duties, uh, you know, are they getting paid a similar thing? And then, you know, that's a lion's share of the budget. And after that, um, we try to balance the budget by getting to a bottom line for all expenses. And I allocate expenses up to the department's and typically because they really don't spend very much money. Um, you know, if the fire department burned 100 gallons of diesel one year, they're probably gonna burn 100 gallons the next year. And the only thing that will really change is the price. And that's bare bones budgeting. And that's the Douglas budget in a nutshell. It just doesn't, we don't get into big variances. When I prepare the budget, I will be keeping what we've been calling for the past couple of years, fiscal notes on all the changes I make to the model. So when I give you the, the spreadsheet, you'll also get a list basically broken down by department of the things I, I had to change in order to uh, either accommodate 
changing realities or changing prices, changing contracts. Um, so you'll have a lot of information. The difficulty that Gene and I have is that some of our most important accounts won't tell us their final numbers until the spring. So whether it's our health insurance renewal or our property casualty insurance renewal, we won't really have good numbers. Um, and I, I, I fear for the premium on our property and casualty next year because of the claim that we're generating this week is gonna blow all our assumptions out of the water. What, what, what happened this week? We had a oil spill at Town Hall. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, yeah. really? Thanks. Yeah, we dumped uh, 275 gallons of number two heating fuel on the floor in the basement, and it has leached into the ground underneath the building. Yikes. So. Hey, Howard, welcome. Hi, Dick. Thank you. It's your meeting. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. I'm uh, sorry. Carry on. <clears throat> so, I mean... So what's, what's our best suggestion? I, I think that your, your biggest costs are gonna be your cost of educating the children in, in Douglas. And that's not just your own public school system, but Norfolk Aggie and BVT as well. Those subjects deserve a couple of meetings so that you can see what their priorities are and, and how they're structured and what impact they have on the overall financial dynamic. On our side, you know, I've got three, really two big departments, police and fire and highway. Highway has a little bit bigger expense budget. And those, after you've done those three, you've covered the lion's share of our operating and you might want to investigate some of those things further um, beyond that. But I think if you really drill down on some of those other topics, you'll have a better sense of, of the pressures we're up against on the budget. I would like, I'm probably gonna get a preliminary estimate on the health insurance renewal in about two weeks. And we'll get a final number until April, but there's a lot of things to talk about with the fund, uh, mostly good things, so far, knock on wood. Um, It'll take some time to brief everybody that's involved. The, the Board of Selectmen, FinCom, Employee uh, Insurance Advisory Committee. It'll, it'll take a good half hour, 45 minutes to get everybody up to speed in, in each committee. Is that any kind of helpful information? <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, Matt, um, when it comes to kind of brainstorming on priorities and things, there are certain things, though, that by their nature are gonna be big topics, right? Like the school budget. I mean, that's, that's just a huge part of the town budget. That's almost automatically the biggest topic or, or not? Well, yeah. And really, I guess the thing there is that, I guess the way you think of it is the school committee is the department head and they really kind of, but they have more authority than the department head because they're, they're signing off on a budget. But ultimately, the finance committee is the only body in town government before town meeting occurs that can truly delve into the school department's budget and require answers. All that we do from the Board of Selectmen's point of view is provide the local share, the local appropriation as a part of our budget. And we don't bother to delve into how it all filters through the way they spend because we don't have any say so over it. So it's really just a, a year over year tallying. And I, you gotta hear from them on what it is they're requesting and why to really understand how we're trying to balance the whole thing out. Right. How do um, we get all the towns in the Valley to come together to put pressure on? <laughs> BBT to change their model for their health insurance to something like self-funded like we've got they've got you know very benefit rich plans by comparison and that drives so much of the expense for what they're charging us year after year that's a question for Matt then Lynn Kind of. 
<laughs> I've, I've, yeah, I think we've, um, we've tried real hard to think this through over all these years. We've met with, we being, I'm trying to remember who was there because not everybody's still in their jobs, but uh, the town administrator from Grafton, the town manager of Upton, Uxbridge, I think Millbury was there. I was there, Sutton was there. So there were six or seven of us that met at Upton Town Hall with Dr. Fitzpatrick. And that's what we focused on was his year over year increase, not the student population or the admissions process, but just his, his back office operations and his benefits. And we thought we had made some progress. Um, looking at it carefully, he had a really bad claims year. He had is actually kind of famous because I think he ended up in a big fight over terminating someone who was sick. Yeah, but it was in the newspaper. It was a massive claim. So he, whoever he was with, he wasn't going to escape premium increases or working rate increases for a little while. I think he's clear of that now. I think that's probably three years ago. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to pitch him, but our group is still of the size where if we make a mistake on who we take, we could upset our own success. So I, I would have, he would have to be willing to share his, his carrier would have to be willing to share the claims information so that we could look at it and see if we could rate it. Um, at a minimum, what I would really like to do as a way to get ourselves in the door is to offer him, because we can do this, to join only the retiree portion of our plan because we have a bookable rate that our carrier allows us to market. So we are actually competing for municipalities around the Commonwealth for their retiree business. Um, that's one way for them to get exposure to what we're doing, even though obviously it's very different Medicare based product, but still um, it builds a communication and they get insight into how we operate to come to board meetings. They get to know how it, how it works, but I, I, we can't force the man to do anything. I, I have some highfalutin ideas about, you know, taxation without representation, constitutional based lawsuits, but what good is that? I, this is a lot of money and I don't think it would turn the dime very much. It is outrageous that anybody can come into any town hall and put a bill on the table and say, you have to pay me this and no, we're not negotiating over what you're paying me. That is just outrageous. If I could do that, I'd be as, as successful as him because you can't miss, right? Oh, I made a mistake. I blew 20 grand. I guess next year I'll charge him 30. <laughs> so what do you want? I wish I had a better outlook than that, but I just, um, I almost, there are times I fear that if we poke our finger in his eye enough, he'll just start recruiting more and more Douglas kids to go to his school. <laughs> He's got the altar. I've always said. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lynn, does that help at all that answer um, or not? Well, no, because we don't have a plan on how to make him change his mind. So <laughs> it just, it just clarifies that there's really nothing we can do about it. Mr. Chair, if I could just tell you that I did call BBT today to get an idea of their timeline. And they're starting to meet in their budget now. Um, they will have prelim numbers in mid-February, and they're having a public hearing on March 4th. So your timeline is kind of tight if you want to act, if you wanted to reach out to communities, finance committees. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, Matt, anything else at this point as we kind of overlook the process for the next two, three months? No, I think um, we've been through the fire drill a bunch of times. Uh, the department heads are well-prepared to the extent that most of them are not dealing with the big accounts because those are back office or benefit accounts. So in terms of diving right into their uh, personnel and expense budgets, I, I don't think you should hold back if you want to start on the municipal side. I just, it's peanuts compared to, to your education costs. Okay. Gene, how about you? Any, any kind of overview comment as we get ready to start the process this, um, this season? Um, I, I agree, you know, 
At this time of year, you asked earlier whether or not we were on track, and we are. It's hard to work without the revenue side of things. Um, we would have start having those numbers at the end of January when the governor you know, sends out his numbers. Um, and then we wait for the big accounts to come in. And that's health insurance, BBT, property and liability. Um, Worcester Regional, we should have by the end of next week, we're looking for the allocation between the water sewer department right now and, and the town so we can get the town's allocation. Um, once we have those pieces and then the other ones start filling in, um, you know, the other thing is COLA, you know, those are the other things that we have to think about as the department stops preparing their budget, you know, how is that going to impact COLA and actually capital would be the other thing. Yeah. How are we doing with free cash right now? Well, we did spend some at the fall town meeting. Um, hold right. on. You go on, I'll pull that up. I don't have that number with me, but luckily I sit at my computer now. So I'm just wondering, um, well, first of all, I just opened the, the floor to the group. Um, as we get ready to go in the next couple of months, does anybody have any comment or question about priorities and the things we should really look at first in terms of what's important to us. Anybody want to speak to that? Howard, you're the chair. Do you have any uh, vision on that or not? Well, I, I know I came in late. I apologize for that. I guess I would ask Matt quickly. Matt, are there any big ticket items you see this year that are different than, let's say, the last fiscal year or the last two fiscal years? So this is going to take up my update too. We might as well just knock that off the agenda because it's the same. Answering your question will be my update. Okay. Um, as you know, I, I work on the budget sort of an iterative process and I have a spreadsheet with locks in numbers and assumptions that go forward as, and I put in the real numbers as people share that information. I have BVT at a rather modest rate of increase this year, hoping against hope that that's true. Um, I've got them factored in at about a four and a half percent year over year increase, hoping that our, our student census stays about even. And we're looking at their, they call it the rate of inertia, four and a half percent. So uh, I'll back up for a second. I, we're looking at revenues increasing about 1.9% this year. So I'll go down the list of things that are probably going to grow faster than that 1.9%. Um, so there's BVT. A lot of uncertainty on the school side because I'm not entirely sure how the transportation contract is going to shake out with the hybrid model. Uh, we do have agreements in place that the school committee has negotiated for rates of compensation uh, to the bus companies for their services. And there is a, a safeguard in there that will um, help us control costs. Some of what the school spends money on for, for buses, especially on the special education piece, is on demand. So if they don't, if they don't send the kids out, they're not paying for that route. I'm not entirely sure. I fully understand. Maybe Heather can help us understand what that will do to the traditional spend on special ed busing. As for the, call them the big yellows, um, that vendor held himself at his rates from last year. So that was a nice concession. If we're closed for a prolonged period of time, the concession would go deeper. But for the most part, we have to recognize that that particular vendor is, is very sensitive to fixed costs. They, they lease or they either lease or purchase their buses on installment. They don't get a break because they're not running the bus. They have to pay the bill. Same thing for their annual insurance bill. Uh, it may break it into quarterly payments, but they have an annual premium that they have to pay whether they're running or not. So those things, you know, we all across the Commonwealth municipalities have accommodated that and basically paid for services we have not received or don't think we're going to receive in order to protect our vendor relationship. Um, <clears throat> last year, we 
were able to negotiate with Telstone and get about, Jean will correct me because she loves how I round numbers up, but around $300,000 closed that we won't see again uh, with our bus contract relationship. But hopefully if we save anything there, it would offset anything that I'm not catching with my assumption around BVT. Uh, the census is slightly up at Norfolk Aggie. Health insurance. Um, Lynn will appreciate this. I mean, you can't get worse timing, right? So the fund is extremely stable. We've done extremely well. Um, controlling costs. Um, last year, the governor, last fiscal year, the governor, in order to deal with COVID, closed down elective surgeries and other elective things. And then COVID kind of glided down over the summer, right when the fiscal year switched over, June 30 to July 1. We were pretty much a low point for COVID. So what we had was an artificially large surplus when we closed a book on the self-insured trust fund. I think the fund as a whole ended up a quarter million bucks uh, in the black, which was a great result. Uh, one of our three groups, the Dudley Charlton School District, had ridiculously low medical loss ratio, like 69%, something crazy. So they were actually looking at a rate decrease. Uh, Webster had a bad year, but they were able to use some of their buy-in to soften the blow. So this year, our claims went really low through June 30th. And then the governor said, okay, go ahead, go get your surgeries. And boom, we spiked in September, especially in October. So now we're in the rate setting process, looking back over our last six months of claims, and we're at 139% of premium um, or working rate, if you want to call it that. Um, if this trend holds out and we don't come back to earth, we're probably looking at the underwriters telling us we need an eight or 9% uh, working rate increase year over year. There's a couple of things. One is I'm optimistic. I think that was may have been a bubble. The underwriters have suggested to us that if the longer we can wait to set the working rate for next year, the better off we'll be because we'll probably have a couple of months that'll come in low and that will even us out. The other thing is we had the surplus from last year. and We also have our equity buy-in, which was a substantial sum of money. So the trust fund currently is at its bylaw mandated cap. So we would have had to return money to the members this year anyway. Um, if I had my druthers, if we got a 9%, I would try to use our equity buy-in in the fund to level that off at about 4%. That would help me a lot to balance the budget. Uh, that's health insurance. Um, very pleased with the results. I, I'll stop there if in case anybody has any questions about health insurance. Howard, does that answer your question? No, uh, not yet. Right. Not done. <laughs> right. So I, I think that question for me, Matt, was the concept. It seems to me in the last couple of years, every year we find where the last year was the fire chief looking to add an additional salary, or boy, you know, at the second. The, the fall town meeting, we had the half million dollar expenditure off the capital committee's need. Um, are there any single ticket items that you've been made aware of from any of the departments over the winter that they'll be looking to put in through their section of the budget this spring? Well, in terms of the department, um, I would, I'm trying, actually, I think Gene's on board with me. I would like to move the cost of revaluation uh, to the special town meeting and not carry it in the operating budget. It's a $50,000 uh, once every three or four years expense when we, uh, we have to have the money available in order to go out to procurement. So we can't let out a contract for $50,000 unless we have the 50,000 already raised and appropriated. Um, 
but that's that's a big chunk of year over year increase in our, our revenues. The other thing I'm trying to I would like to do is expense. I like to expense all cruisers, whether it's police department or fire department. Uh, the chief's car one is starting to age out. I'd like to just kick that down as a hand-me-down and spend the typical cruiser expense, 45000 um, in the expense budget, not put it through capital if I can help it. Um, other, you know, you got to separate capital from this conversation because there's nothing cheap in the capital budget. In terms of operating stuff, I mean, 50000 is about the threshold of change anywhere. We are, I mean, everybody should know uh, negotiating with both police and fire unions as we speak. There are proposals that have been exchanged, and I can't say much more than that. Uh, there is an economic impact whenever you negotiate with the union. So um, uh, nothing crazy. I think we're, I don't think we're going to take a long time to get to agreement. I think both sides can, can probably walk away from the table with good stuff and it'll all be affordable, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be baseline year over year. As far as COLA, um, we try very hard to keep everybody's COLA at the same, roughly the same level. Um, it is important that we look at the teachers union as one of the really important pieces of data that help us inform the COLA discussion on the town side. Last year, the teachers took a zero in a one-year agreement. Um, the municipal unions agreed to take a zero, but when the budget did not, the bottom did not fall out of the budget, the state came through with their, their aid to the town we pulled that back and said, no, we'll pay your COLA. So I, I think there's room for the school committee to financially speaking, uh, give a little catch up with their collective bargaining unit. The issue there though, is whether or not that bargaining unit will do a one-year deal or a three-year deal. And you know, what is, what tone is that gonna set? Um, I would like to address that major contractual issue with the teachers that I was trying to address right before COVID got us. And I would like to do that and once I'm out of the woods. Um, I can recommend to the town a, a utilization of free cash to right the ship in terms of you know, leveling off that compensation table. But I, I feel better doing that once the pandemic is over. People get their shots or the thing is just dying off and we're not gonna have any uh, boogeyman jump out of the woods at us. Um, but to get back to your question, Howard, I, the, on the department side, the increases you're going to see will be line item per line item. They'll be four digits and usually real close to a thousand, two thousand bucks. You're just not going to okay. see. Great. Major. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, Gene, anybody else? You... Go ahead, Howard. Yep. No, go ahead, Dick. Just going to say, does anybody else have a question for Matt at this point? In terms any, of any movement on those projects um, that will bring in money to the town that were discussed way back when? Are those all stalled because it's winter, or what's, what's going um, on? So I'll take one at a time but I'll be trying to be quick about it. Uh, there's a, there was a, a proposal for a warehouse um, between Gilboa Street and Northeast Main that involves the sale of town property. And a lot of this went through town meeting was approved. So follow me here, it gets complicated. We needed a business to move from their existing location to a new location. Once they abandon that site, all of that land can be consolidated and then the project will go forward. The transaction involves no fewer than four purchase and sales agreements. Each one is contingent on the one before it. Number one has been signed. The second purchase and sales agreement 
will lock in the movement of the business from one end of town to the other. That negotiation is waiting for a conclusion from the planning board. So there, there are site plan review and other issues that will, a special permit for manufacturing out, outdoors that need to be approved by the planning board. Once that occurs, I would think that's two or three months from now, that second purchase and sales agreement can be signed. And then the last two were really, I mean, I'm sure Howard's seen this happen. We may end up with three closings in one day. Everybody will be in basically the same building walking checks for a couple million bucks from one room to the other as all of the agreements fall into place. I'm very optimistic. I think that the final end user is a, a major international company. They don't fool around. They're not messing with us. This isn't, you know, Joe Blow's fish and rod company. It's a major international logistics operation. They need this. Um, so we will benefit in a bunch of ways. We will sell them real estate. They will have to get a building permit. And then once they are finally done, there will be a final resting value. Um, I do think that will come online within the next year and a half. The project that's on the fast track, you might not think it involves us very much, but it is a source of new revenue. There's a lot on the other side of 146 that is shared by three towns, Sutton, Douglas, and Uxbridge. The Douglas piece is tiny, but you can't build on it if you don't work with Douglas <laughs> because we cut the building in half uh, with our little triangle of Douglas. And we really want to be their water supplier because it helps us do a whole bunch of stuff with water and sewer that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. That is, um, they've gone for a MEPA review. Uh, if you drive by the Shell station, you'll notice there are traffic study tubes across the road. There's a lot of really significant activity has occurred. That's going to happen as well. It's another big international company that needs it for logistics site. Um, what do we get from that? Well, we'll get our share of the building permit. Um, we don't own any land over there. It's privately held. But the, um, the real benefit there is that it probably may open the door for us to be able to apply for MassWorks grants for the infrastructure that that entire part of town needs which will soften the blow for the taxpayer for the long run. Um, the rest of what we deal with in terms of potential new growth um, on a commercial sector is cannabis, 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 cannabis. I, I never thought in my life, <laughs> since I don't smoke this stuff, that I would ever talk so much about pot. And, <laughs> you know, you want, you want to have fun, put the potheads in charge of the pot industry, <laughs> right? Because everybody's peace, love, and joy. And then now, right, we've got to do serious stuff like planning board decisions. And I, I got to say, the people we've dealt with that have come to Douglas and want to locate here have been fantastic. They've been true to their word. They're building the things they said they would build. I hope their pro forma is as accurate as the plans they submit to the planning board. Um, I'm optimistic. I mean, I think we have about $190,000 worth of host community agreement revenue already in the budget. The rest of what will happen there would be retail activity that we won't put in the budget because we can't trust that it will materialize. We don't know how many customers are gonna have and how well they're gonna do, but that there's upside potential there that's significant. The last piece would be, um, Longer term, um, long term, well, we'll put it this way. Within the next two years, most people, the forecast is right now, I should, I don't own this forecast. It's a professional energy consulting firm, tradition and energy that advises the town, advises many municipalities. The, the forecast for the price of energy in the Northeast for the next two or three years is nothing short of grim. Yeah, from a cost perspective. Nothing short sure. of what? Grim. Grim, ugh. Because we just use more and more energy up here. We don't have any way 
to increase our energy infrastructure because all those doors have been shut by various interests for various reasons. I won't get into the merits. It doesn't change the fact. Brayton Point closed down. There's no more coal plants in the Northeast. The nuclear power plant's gonna close down. That's gonna take off a supply. The remaining supply will be natural gas fired or renewable. There's no renewable assets. They, they haven't been built yet. So what's gonna happen is in the winter when natural gas is prioritized for residential home heating needs, the cost of using natural gas to produce electricity will probably double the cost of electricity. What does that all mean? Those communities that get out ahead of this and build out the solar infrastructure will probably in the long run benefit in many, many ways. Not the least of which is from pilot agreements, ground leases. We're exploring all of these possibilities because we have to. There aren't that many communities around that have as much open space uh, that we do. You gotta be, obviously, you have to be smart about it. You have to think through the impact on the environment. Being mindful of the fact that without energy, none of us can live here. If you had to go outside right now and pitch a tent and try to make it through the night, you wouldn't have much fun. That um, was topic, wasn't you it? You said Sorry. that you you said that the energy or the electric rates would double for anybody who isn't locked in. And and that's based on natural gas usage, yeah. the, the the price of natural gas going up. Yeah, we have energy agreements for the town of Douglas secured out to five years. So we have locked in our price with a very low bid. We had ridiculous number of bidders because at one point, not that long ago, they couldn't, they're trying to offload all the energy. So we were able to, to get in there and get a good rate. What, what are we locked in? What will happen after that five-year time horizon? What, what are we locked in on? Electricity or oil? Or what are we, when you said we got it locked in? Electricity. For the, for, the, for the municipal building. Okay. Yeah, for municipal accounts. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anybody else, a question for Matt? I, I have one more question for Matt. You had mentioned about putting the police vehicle or vehicles on the expense side. Is there, is there an ad advantage to that from from a municipal standpoint or from an accounting standpoint well i'll let gene take some of that most of that um it has been the practice of the town i think gene for the last two cycles of cruiser replacement yeah we we made that decision uh, at least two cycles ago um because we consider those a consumable what we did is we staggered them so they weren't coming due to be replaced at the same time so we started buying two, two, two. And at one point we were taking what we weren't spending in that year and using it for a non-reoccurring expense and just shifting it into the budget. And then when the police cruises started coming back and we needed to replace them, we would put it back in that, in that line item. So um, it just helps us repair and maintenance costs. It helps us with just with the, you know, the timing of the replacement. There's just a lot of benefits to doing that. And they are a consumable item. They're on the they're out there 24 seven. Um, so uh, we did uh, kind of escalate that the last time because they were changing the model and we didn't want to go with the new model. Um, so we moved up the schedule a little bit, but we would, we would like to stay with that staggered schedule. Gene, just one more question on that if I could. Uh, go ahead. So, Gene, uh, did you get any pushback from the auditors on that, you know, around the, the capital? Um, you know, would those vehicles qualify for a capital lease? Oh, they well, they're still a capital purchase. They're still on the fixed assets schedule. It's just okay. what we're looking at. Oh, you're just talking for budgeting purposes. Huh? Okay. Correct. Understood. Okay. Uh, anybody else? For, go ahead, Matt. My two cents on that is... Um, to the extent that items like police cruisers, I'd go so far as ambulances, they last five years. Once they're done, they're done. We get no trade-in value. 
we can't even use them for other functions in town. They, they're really just worn out. I, um, from experience, I worked for a town trying to budget where they, they bought everything on a lease or installment. And it sounded so great, right? Oh, let's take this and spread it over five years. And don't worry about it. It's only 20 grand on the operating budget, right? Well, the problem is they were paying interest. And some years the interest rates were high. And you, if you do this and you say, well, my ambulance no longer runs. I have to buy an ambulance. And the year you decide to buy the quarter million dollar asset, the rest of the economy in the country is going to hell in a handbasket. Now you're paying 7% because that's the best rate you can get on an item that's only going to last five years. I, it ended up where the town treasurer in, in Tiverton and I worked out and told everybody, you're paying like 56 grand a year just to use other people's money. You could be buying a new cruiser every year for the money you waste on all that interest. That community will never do it right. But I think here in Douglas, after watching this work for about three years, this is the right way to do it. You buy it for cash. You get a good warranty, you take care of it, move on. And there's no bill. If you get stuck with a lemon, there's things you can do, but you don't have to sit there and pay that stupid note. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Anybody else for Matt at this point? I have All a right. question about the roads. What's that, Sandy? Hi. Yeah, I have a question about the streets. I know it was brought up in a meeting about the amount of money that we're going to have to start putting into the roads. Does that come to us at any point planning for that? Yeah, and I think this is one of the broader ranging conversations about the fiscal health of the community going forward. Um, if you, if is anybody on FinCom who needs a copy of the road study, the pavement management study, um, I think it's on the town website, but we'll get you a copy because it's not a long document and it's very, very informative on what it's gonna to take to support the, the, the entire roadway network as an asset. And if we wanted to really do be serious about this, we'd be spending about 1.7 million a year on roads. That's not gonna happen right away. Um, the good news I think is that we are probably done fixing bridges across the Mumford hmm. and other places. We've been using our chapter 90 funds every year and, and sinking them all into one project just to get a bridge done. Um, this year, well, the good news is we went out to bid on the Cedar Street Bridge and it came in much lower. We thought it was going to be $820,000 project. It looks like it's going to be about six fifty. dollars So we'll have chapter 90 funds to spend this year. Just be mindful, it's only 300 grand a year, so or 350 a year. It's really not a lot of money in terms of what the need is. And that's where conversations about things like the sale of real estate and unpredictable cannabis revenues needs to be joined by the leadership of the town because the one asset you want to be willing to, well, maybe we have to skip it this year, would have to be roads because in one year most roads won't deteriorate so much in one year where you're going to sink the ship if you don't do something for a year because you have another need somewhere so but it's hard to say we're going to have an earmarked fund i i think we have to see how how the town wants to deal with the sale of real estate and cannabis revenues in particular in or in the alternative say something like future uh, ground lease income uh, and municipal property from solar fields that get built uh, should be dedicated to a road fund. Um, but that's a, there's a lot of quote unquote doing to that. And I'll let Gene be the expert on how you form those accounts and fund them. But um, the, the most important thing about that study was there are roads that are about to slip into the next category down in terms of their quality and their longevity. Those are the ones that you should address right away. Not necessarily the worst roads in town, but those towns that are, uh, those roads in town that are about to hit an inflection point and their rate of deterioration will increase rapidly. 
get it right before that happens, it'll be much more cost effective. Andy, any more questions on that? Yeah, so I guess, are we going to start doing something about that soon or are we gonna wait? Does that come to us soon or what's the next step, I guess, on the roads? I think when it comes to roads, the Board of Selectmen do have a very important role to play because technically they are your highway commissioners as well as your Board of Selectmen. It's their responsibility to take care of the asset. I know that when the presentation was made in front of the board, there was strong consensus that something has to be done. It's identifying the funding source. It has to be a funding source that will be available for quite a few years running and not just the one time burst of activity. So do I really know? I'm not, not quite sure yet. I wanna see, I can't make a recommendation to anyone until I have more information about sources of revenue. Um, could we take, for instance, free cash and instead of spending it on capital needs, could we spend it on roads? That would be a, a, a good question. I'm, I'm afraid not because if you look at the total amount of capital requests from both the municipality and your school system, I think, I'm gonna scroll over to my spreadsheet here for a second. We're at just about $18 million. That includes, that includes the police department's request for about a $9 million building. So call it $10 million worth of capital that we have to come up with the next, really next five or six years to sustain the asset base of the town. So I'm not so sure uh, our existing run with free cash is gonna be enough to handle that and a million dollars a year, a million and a half on the roads. So we're gonna to have to just keep digging away at revenue and see if we can get a source. Matt, could you or Gene send us that outline you've got on the roads that you referred to? And then if the request for significant funding were to come this year, or a portion of that, where would it come through? I guess, what committee would we see? What department would we see starting to ask for funding? So Matt, you, oh, you kind of implied it would start with the Board of Selectmen, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think, Again, it's an opinion, so I don't want to push it too hard, but in my opinion, roads are capital. They are part of the fixed asset base of the town. The taxpayer paid for them. Many of them are 30, 40 years old. Time to take care of them. They're still, it's not a building or a vehicle, but it's still a really important asset of the town. I, this is the first time this year that anybody's gone to the capital committee and suggested to them, hey, look, Roads are your problem too. So I'm waiting to see how this all shakes out. Okay. Remember, Capital Committee is a creature of the Board of Selectmen. So whatever they re re recommend, the board will have to take into consideration. Um, so Howard, I wonder if when we set our agendas for future meetings, if we could ask the Capital Committee to have an item there about road maintenance. Does that make sense or not? Well, I think it just goes to the issue of having the capital committee in front of us to talk to us about what their itemization is. Yeah. I guess I guess what I still am not quite clear on, I think it's still a little bit to Sandy's concerns. What department, because capital is a committee, what department would have within its budget the request for funding if the capital committee said we needed to start funding, significant funding for road maintenance, more significant than normal. Wouldn't it be the high? <laughs> what was that? Oh. 
Is that the answer, Matt? Yeah. Highway Department, mm -hmm. Lynn, is that what you thought? That's what I would think, but what do I know? <laughs> Matt, is that the answer? That it would, if, if Capital said we should do it and Highway and Board of Selectmen said we should do it, it would come to us through the Highway Department's budget request? No, it would come through Capital. Through what? It would, it would come through Capital. The Highway yeah. Department the department that oversaw the budget um, because it would fall under their jurisdiction, but it would have to be a recommendation from the Capital Committee. Gene, I understood that it would have to be a recommendation from the Capital Committee, but my question is still, what department would we see it appear in its budget request? It would be in the Capital. Capital has its own article the, um, where they put their recommendations forward. The departments present to the capital committee, the capital committee rates the projects and then they bring it forward as a capital article. So Sandy, does that help? It would come directly through an, uh, an article in the Warren saying we now want to approve X for this year to start working up the uh, roads a little more. Matt, I guess the question then the follow up is, do you foresee that this fiscal year in this request? coming through capital. Yeah, so we've identified a couple of road projects that are on the list. Um, I think there's a stretch of South Street in there, a Cemetery Street where we just did some water work. And I'm, I'm misplacing the other one in my mind, but yes, they have identified the projects they wanna do right away and put them into the pipeline for the conversation. You know, just to get okay. it on the table. Sandy, finally, does that help a little? Yes, that helps. Thank you. <laughs> now, I will add to my comment, Howard. If you wanted to ask John about the conditions of the road or the pavement road study, then, then that would be a good time to ask him when he was presenting his budget. As highway. Yeah. And to Dick's point, we might want to then see capital committee too. Right, Dick? Okay. So should we start to do that, Dick? Should we start to ask Gene to help us set up the scheduling for the next three or four meetings? Yeah, I was actually, um, Matt gave kind of an overview of his thoughts as we begin the budget process. And Gene, I wondered if you had anything to add to that, just sort of an overview conceptual as we get started or, or not. Um, the only thing I'll add is I've, Suzanne has been out for the last couple of days, but I would like to work with her on the calendar and I would like to back up the budget from the town meeting um, and get that to you by the next, by your next meeting um, and maybe push the revenue piece up a little bit. So maybe have that in, in the, one of the next two meetings is have the revenue piece so that we can have that basis that other than that, um, you tell me which departments you'd like to see and I will work with them on the order if that's okay with you. Um, so it works around their schedule as well. But if you let me know which departments you want, I will work on scheduling that for you. Um, I do need to know a couple of things. One, do you wanna continue with a hybrid meeting, totally hybrid, or do you wanna have the resource room? I'm thinking, hmm. what's your? Yeah, I defer, I defer to the group here. What does everybody wanna do? I think if we're going to have people coming in from departments, it might be easier face to face with social distancing and masks. Yep. I hate Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good suggestion. Well, it takes Twenty minutes to get on. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I could have driven there and back, Carol. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what's What's the proposed date for the town meeting? Is it in May? It is the first Monday of May, and that is May 3rd. Okay, and it will be outside, I'm sure. That I don't know. That's up to the moderator. Yep. So, Howard, um, I think I'd like to turn this part of the meeting over to you uh, just as we start to see okay. where we want to schedule things in order. Do you have... Um, Okay. So, like, should so, we do the school? Should we do the school pretty first, pretty quick? Because that's such a huge part of it. Be, before we start on the uh, schedule, can I just ask one quick question, and I'm and, and it'll be quiet after that. Um, 
regarding the roads, did the method or the funding sources for road repair, um, ha has that formula or method changed in the last five years or significantly recently? Or has it just always been that we pay for it? The town has been repairing bridges for several years. So there hasn't been a process for allocating the chapter 90 funds. And that's why, you know, Howard wants to laugh, but I don't have a good answer for who's going to bring this forward because you haven't had a road program. You right now, you don't have a road program. That's what we need to build. We need to decide who's going to decide. There is no answer to that question. We're going to start with capital because it's an asset. The highway department builds your roads. They fix your roads. They don't make the decision on what road is a priority. That is not their call. That is the Board of Selectmen's call as a road commissioners. They haven't finalized a system for prioritizing which road they want to do first. And that will drive what they need to budget every year. The reaction to the report was strong. We haven't taken it up at a meeting since. Um, the road study is, if you follow, if you're on the town website, you click on highway department, the pavement management study is one of the links you can click to on the left si left hand side of the screen. Um, let's see if I can. No, it won't. I just sent it, Matt, to the committee. So it's you know, like I say, it's it's a very concise, uh, powerful document. The Stantec does great work. They did an excellent rating service for us. But even after all the ratings been done, there's still choices that need to be made about what the priorities are. Now, I mentioned South Street because internally, for instance, that's a great example of it's a medical evacuation route. We run school buses all the time up and down the road. It's a numbered route. It's in really bad shape and certain sections of it are in really bad shape. So it's kind of an instant candidate for being addressed. As you go forward for a couple of years, it won't be so obvious. Okay, uh, Phil, does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does help. So, so it's it's been the formula and the the idea of paying for roads and whatnot is has not recently changed in the eyes of the state or the feds or anything like that. It's just something that's always been there. Okay, um, Gene. Anything else overview wise? Uh, no, I'm just waiting for guidance. Uh, like I said, if you can be flexible about who you meet with first, I'll work with the departments on scheduling that. If you just let me know which departments you want to meet with. So Howard, how do you want to proceed? I guess I'll, I'll give you the so let, con now. So let's, thank you. Thank you, Dick. So let's do that. Let's, let's feed into Gene. So I would think we would want to see the police department. I would think we'd want to see the fire department. We'd want to see obviously the school department would want to see, or would we, would we want to see the Blackstone Valley Tech Department? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's four, Gene. It sounds like we might want to see the Highway Department and the Capital Improvements Committee. That might be six. And Anyone if, else? And Howard, if we Howard. see Capital, do we want to give them a heads up that we're wanting to look to a kind of a long-term road improvement plan so they can start thinking about that first? I think that's more their bailiwick. That's okay. that's what they tell us, right? That's their, what they're there to do, looking through what they get given by the different departments. So I'd let them report a little bit to us where their thoughts are on that when they're in front of us there, right? Okay. Um, how about public building maintenance? Public building maintenance. I don't need to see that department per se. Uh, aren't we supposed to meet with all of the departments? Isn't that what the the charter says? I, I I'm just trying to understand. Are we pick pick different ones to do every other year, or do we are we supposed to meet between all of the departments? 
Well, I think, go ahead. I was going to say, regarding building maintenance, wouldn't that be like the roof on the town hall, which is always a problem and that requires a lot of money and, you know, um, the post office getting painted and those kinds of things? I mean, don't you think we should have a little input from them? Again, that's, I'm deferring to everyone else. I, I've kind of outlined the ones I'd like to hear from, but everyone else get in for what you feel you'd also like to hear from. I would like to hear from building maintenance. Well, I think so too. Are we putting enough money into maintaining our buildings? Or is it starting to fall apart? Is, is, was it, was it, that tank getting old? Is that why we ended up losing 275 gallons of fuel? Or what was the reason for that? The float okay. got stuck. What? what was it, Matt? The float got stuck in the pump. <laughs> oh, not really a, not really an age or maintenance thing. Okay. Um, when when does the school committee, so or or the budget part of the school committee, when are they ready to present? That usually, that takes them some time, doesn't it, or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think Gene is offered to kind of reach out and stagger based on availability and based, you know, and, and perhaps on also how much information they think they've got to be ready to come in front of us. So Howard, is your sense that once we get into February, we'll be meeting pretty regularly then? Well, I think what we've tried to do is if we can meet, you know, the, the second and fourth Tuesdays of February, I've got them as the ninth and the 23rd and the same exact dates for March, that's four nights to carry us through near the end of March. And if Gene can schedule, some of these can be doubled up. If we can see what we look to see by March 23, we can then start to talk about the public meeting and go from there. The only thing I'm concerned about is BBT and what you hope to accomplish. I remember being at the September town meeting and the town meeting not passing their budget and then having to have the November town meeting in hopes that you would have a chance to work with other communities. Um, I don't know if you were on yet, Howard, but the public meeting is March 4th and they're starting to work on their preliminary budget in the mid February. So I don't know how you wanna proceed but that, that's not involving me at all, but that would be between you and other finance committees, between other communities. Well, I think that's right. I, it, it, it's my experience that I don't get a particularly great amount of information. I get information from BVT at, at them coming before us, but I don't find that that's the event that would affect what might be the town's desire to affect how much we put into their budget each year. So again, that's an ongoing discussion that I maybe need to again pick up with Matt and uh, perhaps the chairman of the board of selectmen has talked to me a little bit about that as well. So Gene, is there, are you, are you pretty confident we can have somebody at our, our first meeting in February? I will start reaching out tomorrow. Okay. And then we'll it, meet in a, we'll meet in a town hall then, right? Whoever can make I will, it in. I will, yeah, I will reserve the resource. I already reserved the resource room going forward until June. They booked us. So I just wanted to make sure that was still um, the way the finance committee wanted to proceed. How are you going to work that out with planning board? Because aren't they in that room tonight? I did, um, yes, they are because they had posted a public hearing, uh, right. but typically that is the finance committee meeting room alternate right. the selectmen. So I did allow I did allow them to use it, Carol. And right. they, Howard was gracious enough to agree to our uh, total Zoom meeting. Right. So when? How can the finance committee meet at the same time as we do then? Because we can't get too many people in that other small room with social distancing. Uh, yeah, that. You know, we, again, we always had that, the finance committee has always reserved that room alternate, especially during budget season. The right, and I think the 
yeah. typically yeah. we had the other room. So I, I don't know how they're going to handle it going forward. Um, I just know that, you know, tonight we agreed to do a total Zoom meeting so they could hold their public meeting that was advertised. Yeah. So, so we'll Carol, be we'll be... Will part of us still be able to go Zoom? Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of nervous. Yes. You know, I'm kind of nervous to get near people until I get that shot. Oh, I get it. I get it, Carol. If you get one, let me know. I'll come join you. <laughs> I'll get one too. Um, I already got mine. Yeah, so I'm there you go. Age. <laughs> How did you manage that, Hella? <laughs> You're just a so, kid. I, it's my employer. Okay. So, so why don't we? So, Carol, to that point, that's what Jean's yeah. saying. We'll do the next. These next four, we'll do public. Uh, in person, keeping the Zoom hybrid option for those who choose to. But as we start to meet with the boards again, this was this was easier to do all Zoom. But as we start to meet with the boards, I think to Lynn's point, it, it's just uh, or, or maybe yeah, it's it's yeah, better they, to do it in person. They usually have material to pass out, and it's kind of hard where they're going to yep. mail it yep. all to us, and we've got to print it, and you know, it's just it's more messy. So how about that? So why don't we plan for people's schedules? It looks like it's going to fall to February 9th and 23rd and March 9th and 23rd. Those will be in person at the town, town hall with the Zoom hybrid option for those who choose. And then Jean and I will work in next week or so on that developing schedule of who we'll see and we'll be able to post that before that next meeting as to who we'll see at that next meeting at least. Gene, I didn't mean to miss your point with uh, BVT, but it's my perception that uh, seeing them here before their March 4th event doesn't significantly affect what they would look to do at their March 4th event. So I don't need to try to get them before March 4 if you find it difficult to get them to schedule it that way. So should we, Gene, review meeting minutes? We did already. That was oh, our gift man. to you, Howard. I missed that? <laughs> That's heartbreaking. That was our gift to you. And to you, Gene. I asked the acting chair to take that item out of order. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> All right. Then does anyone have any new business? Mm -hmm. Okay. I will entertain a motion. So, so moved. A motion. It's got to be a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Right. Dick Vandenberg made the motion. Okay. Dick uh, made the motion. Anyone second. want a second? Second. Sandy? Lynn? Lynn, second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Need a, how, Aye. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Um, you need that via Zoom? Carol so Godlinski, aye. Dick Vandenberg, aye. Mike Cutnack, aye. Joel Landry, aye. Andy Kuypers, aye. 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 <laughs> Heather Moore, aye. Howard D'Amico, aye. 